look at this iceberg chart and say to my face that I am not a goddamn maniac. Somebody needs to stop me because this is lunacy. This is insanity. You thought it was weird last week with the Sleep and Dreams iceberg and even weirder before that with the fucking Windows iceberg? Well, it's about to get so much weirder. So, buckle your fuckles, kiddos. Let's get ready for the missing persons iceberg. And before we begin, even though you're already buckled and fuckled, let me just forewarn you, this will be split into two parts. So, part one will consist of the first four levels of the iceberg, part two, the last half of it. Mostly because this thing is so fucking big that neither me nor my editor would be comfortable cranking this out at the normal speed that we crank it out. So, uh, yeah. Let's get into this shit. Johnny Ghosh. Now, Johnny Ghosh was a young paperboy in Des Moines, Iowa, who was kidnapped on September 5th, 1982. And he's presumed to have been kidnapped. Obviously, I wouldn't have used that word if not. Yeah, I knew what he speak. But there's been no arrests and the case is now cold, but still open. There's nothing too remarkable about it in terms of what happens or how things wind up. Supposedly, the mother has met her son after this, but there's never been anything that can be confirmable. Confirmable enough to have it on the Wikipedia page, at least. Um, there was national interest about the case, though. Noreen, Johnny's mother, testified in Senate hearings on organized crime and organized pedophilia, and its alleged role in her son's abduction, which of course got her death threats because Redditors did exist before the internet, somehow. Uh, she justified the creation of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and she was invited to the White House by President Ronald Reagan for the dedication ceremony, which is of note, as much as I may hate Ronald Reagan. There's also the Bonacci allegations, which is, you know, a 21-year-old Paul A. Bonacci told his attorney that he had been abducted into a sex ring with Ghosh as a teenager and forced to participate in Ghosh's kidnapping. The issue is, is that despite the fact that he did know stuff that supposedly no one else should know, he was indicted on pre-jury. Uh, funnily enough, though, he did accuse a Republican Party activist and businessman, Lawrence E. King, uh, who also served as director of the Franklin Credit Union in Omaha, Nebraska, of running an underage prostitution ring and victimizing him since an early age, which I wouldn't put past most rich old Republicans. Madeline McCann. The disappearance of Madeline McCann is a very messy one because it's the most reported on disappearance ever. Yeah. She was three when she disappeared, and uh, she hasn't been found since. She got lost in Portugal, snatched right out of a crib, never seen again. Of course, there is an issue with the fact that no one knows what did it. Uh, unlike the Johnny Ghosh case, it's not for sure that Madeline was kidnapped because of the fact that the detectives in charge of this suspected the parents the parents suspected Ocean Club employees, and there was no substantial proof for either, leading to this messy, drawn-out slew of arguing between the two that eventually ended at around 2013. Timothy Pitson. Jesus, can I get one that isn't a kid so I can crack some jokes about this? God damn. Now, on May 11, 2011, a six-year-old American boy, Timothy James Pitson, was dropped off at school, yada yada, and then his mom comes and picks him up. Now, Amy Fry Pitson, his mother, took him on a three-day trip to various amusement and water parks, and then committed suicide in a motel room. She left a note stating that Timmy was safe but would never be found, and uh, he hasn't. There's been a sort of hoax about his reappearance where some sort of hobo who just got out of jail pretended to be Timmy because he looked young and then got arrested and sent back to jail. Really sad stuff, but I hope Timmy is okay. Amy Lynn Bradley. Now, Amy Lynn Bradley was a woman who disappeared off of a Caribbean cruise in 1988. Tragic stuff, and, uh, 
It doesn't end there. It obviously doesn't or it wouldn't be on this iceberg. She was supposedly spotted in a brothel in 1999 by a member of the U.S. Navy, but from there the case has gone cold. Natalie Holloway. Natalie Holloway was an American teenager who graduated graduated, went on a nice big party trip, and then fucking disappeared in the Caribbean. Uh, moral of the story, just don't go to the Caribbean. That sounds like a terrible fucking idea. Now, a few suspects were arrested in this case, but nothing was ever found. The body has never been recovered. She's never been spotted. She just simply vanished off the face of the earth. Uh, the suspects that were arrested were let go because there was no way to you know, prove that it was them. And the Dutch Air Force even got into this, and they still didn't find anything, which is sad. I hope she found peace, or she's living happily wherever she may be. Lauren Spire, or I don't know how to say that. I'm so sorry. Uh, she was a woman who disappeared in 2011 following an evening at Kilroy Sports Bar in Indiana. Uh, Spire... Yeah, we're just going to rock with that. Spire was a 20-year-old student at the time, so she wasn't supposed to be drinking, but you know how younger people are. They do that. And uh, though her disappearance generated national press coverage, Spire's presumed dead, and there's never been anything ever found of it. Michaela Garrett. Michaela Garrett is a schoolgirl who went missing in November of 1988. It's always really sad when a kid goes missing because it's a life cut short. And there is no happy ending, there's just a sort of cold justice when someone is caught. Which thankfully did happen here. The murderer was caught, David Misk, the scumbag, who is charged for the kidnapping and murderer, is currently imprisoned for the murder and on trial for the murder of two other women in 1986. So it's very good that this sick bastard was caught, and I hope that he does not enjoy his time in prison and drops the soap often. Morgan Nick. Now, Morgan Nick was a young girl who was kidnapped and went missing at a Little League baseball game. She was never found, but there are later developments where a vacant house in Oklahoma had DNA evidence that could show that Nick had once been in the house. However, cadaver dogs never found anything, and the case went cold. In the aftermath, her mother started the Morgan Nick Foundation, which helps parents cope with the disappearances of children and help prevents children from going missing, which I think is a very noble cause. I hope that whatever happened to you, you're okay, Morgan Nick. Aisha Degree was a young girl who went missing from Shelby, North Carolina, in the early morning hours of February 14th, 2000. For whatever reason, she packed her book bag and left the family home that she resided in, walking along a nearby highway despite heavy rain and wind. She never came back. Her book bag was unearthed at a construction site, but she's never been found, and there's been nothing to prove that she's anywhere, really. Zeb Quinn Zeb Quinn was an 18-year-old man who worked at a local Walmart in Asheville, North Carolina. He was planning to buy a car after his shift on the day that he went missing, and he never really came home. He took a phone call, supposedly, said he was frantic, and sped off. However, 17 years later, the last man to see him alive, Robert Jason Owens, was indicted on charges of murdering Quinn, and at the time has been found guilty, I believe. In 1961, a young girl came home to find that her mother, Joanne Risch, was absent. Uh, several unconfirmed sightings of apparently disoriented Risch walking on nearby roads later that day were reported, but she was never found. There was some evidence to see that maybe Rish had struggled, but there was also evidence to see that maybe Rish had staged the disappearance and a shady backstory before she settled down and was married only fueled the flames of not quite knowing what was going on. She's never been found, and no one's ever been arrested in the case, and to this day she remains missing. Jimmy Hoffa 
Jimmy Hoffa was a notable union leader and, in general, ruckus causer who was disliked by both authorities and the mafia. After he spent some time in prison, he got out and started causing more trouble as he did, and then he disappeared and was never found. It's a general consensus among crime historians and investigators that the Mafia just straight fucking murked Hoffa and hid the body, but because of the fact that we can't find the body, we will never quite know. But I do remember that one Mythbusters episode where they went to the baseball stadium and tried to see if they hit him in the cement. Shelley Miscavige. Michelle Diane Miscavige, known as Shelley, is the wife of Church of Scientology leader David Miscavige, and she was last seen in public August 2007, which is really suspicious, because she looked visibly changed and her mood seemed to have cowed before she finally disappeared from the public eye. Now, as we all know, Scientologists tend to be complete and utter fucking assholes who don't deserve the hair off of your anus. So I wouldn't be surprised if David just straight had her murked, and that's why she hasn't been seen for over a decade. Overall, though, I hope that she isn't dead, and that she is okay, and that uh, Scientology ends soon. That, that shit just needs to go. Tara Grinstead. Tara Grinstead was a teacher who was murdered. She disappeared in 2005 and was declared dead in 2010. And finally, around 2017, they had a solid lead and suspect. And then Ryan and Bo Dukes were both arrested for the murder of Miss Grinstead. The trial of Bo Dukes began in March 19, 2019, and he was found guilty for his role in helping cover the murder up, sentenced to 25 years. And uh, Ryan Boots Dukes, wow, case has been delayed because of the fact that his lawyers were unconstitutionally denied funds. Amelia Earhart. This is probably one of the most famous disappearance cases in all of history, just because of how influential Miss Earhart was to in aviation and women around the world. So understandably, there's a lot of weird and wacky theories about what happened to her. Of course, the main three are the crash and sink theory, which is that she ran out of fuel over the ocean, fucking crashed her plane, and then is now resting in a watery grave. This is the most reasonable. There's also the Gardner Island hypothesis because of the fact that remains of a plane were found and uh, a skeleton was found as well. The issue is, is that the skeleton is three inches shorter than what Amelia Earhart was and it's also definitely a male skeleton. And then the last theory is Japanese capture because of the fact that this was a tense time and we were pretty close to war, if not already there. Uh, she could have crashed somewhere in Japanese land territory and then been captured because of the fact that she was famous and held us so. However, no body has been recovered. It's unlikely that anybody ever will be recovered, so the mystery will always remain just that, a mystery. D.B. Cooper Dan B. Cooper was a pseudonym used by an unknown man who threatened to fucking blow up a plane after hijacking it. He negotiated for some cash and then jumped out of the plane, and uh, he's never been seen again. The main theory is, is that when he jumped out of the plane, even though he had a parachute and all that cash with him, because of the fact it was stormy, he probably died. That's really likely that he just died. Uh, some cash has been found in the area where he supposedly jumped, and the fact that he never showed up anywhere ever again is also convincing for the he fucking died theory. And so ends level one. Now we go on to level two, but before we continue, I'd like to talk to you about a few things. Uh, if you're a regular around here, you know that the main selling point of my iceberg chart videos is the humor. I don't always get things right. There isn't, you know, months of research put into these videos, but I am relatively funny. But I will not be joking about human lives. You may have noticed that this isn't as funny as beforehand, you know, other iceberg chart videos. And that's because I don't want to be making crass and insensitive jokes about missing children. So if it's a very popular case like D.B. Cooper or Jimmy Hoffa, I'll make jokes about it. But I'm going to do my best to try and keep this tone a little bit more serious. Um, if you're new around here, you probably don't care. Thank you for still watching if you are new. I hope you enjoy the rest of the video as we get into it. That's enough of me fucking jibber-jabbering. Let's get into level two. Buckle your fuckles. 
Kyron Horman. Kyron Horman was a young boy who disappeared from his elementary school in Oregon after attending a science fair. It sparked the largest investigation in Oregon history, but no, nothing was found in typical fashion. Uh, there is some legal proceedings about whether or not the parents did it. Uh, the mother, his mother, did fail two polygraph tests, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret about polygraph tests. They're actually fucking garbage. Yeah, fun fact, 90% of forensic science is complete and utter bullshit. Genuinely, the only thing that is any good to have ever come from that is DNA evidence. Fingerprints can be faked, and 90% of the time you don't leave a clear fingerprint. Uh, the polygraph test is actual smoke and mirrors, like genuine bullshit. I could throw a pie at your face, and that would tell me more than a polygraph test does. People have hooked plants up to polygraphs, asked the plant questions, and found that the plant was lying according to it when a plant doesn't speak. But that's a little bit of a sidetrack there. Something for a different video. Overall, I hope whatever happened to Kyron, he has a little bit of peace now. Kathleen McCormick Durst. Kathleen Durst was an unfortunate soul who happened to be married to one Mr. Robert Durst. They married in 1972, and ten years later, in 1982, she unexpectedly disappeared. And, uh, this would be just a regular missing persons case, sparing the fact that Robert Durst is a murderer, a very prolific murderer, who's killed several people, and then when questioned about it on a TV documentary for HBO, said, straight up confessed to it and said shit so vile that the editors had to rearrange what he said to make it safe for TV. So, uh, yeah, rest in peace, Kathleen. Maura Murray. In 2004, Maura Murray informed her supervisor and her school that there had been a death in the family and that she would need the week off. She then looked up places in Vermont on her personal computer on MapQuest. That tells you this case is old. And then she started driving. She got into a car crash on Route 112 near Woodsville, New Hampshire. A few people stopped to ask if she needed help, but she claimed that she had already called roadside assistance, and then she was never seen again. The authorities treated this case like she wanted to go missing, because that's what it sounded like to them at first. I mean, telling your boss that there's been a death in the family when there hasn't been a death in the family, telling your school the same thing, and then going to Vermont for a week, and suddenly never coming back sounds like a very well put together plan. The fact that there's been no body ever found also makes this a little bit more in that direction. Because of the fact that it was in 2004, this was the first major missing persons case to have been discussed online, and it does have significance for that. However, she's yet to have been found, and a body has never been recovered. So, rest in peace if you are dead, or wherever you are, if you're still alive. Raise one up for your old life. Brian Schaefer. Brian Schaefer was an Ohio State University student that went missing just before spring break in 2006. He went out to celebrate the beginning of it, and according to the security footage at the bar he was at, stepped outside for a bit to talk with some women, came back inside, and then was never recorded leaving. Now, it is entirely possible that the cameras just simply missed his departure. The cameras did pan, and there was one that was manually moved. However, the fact that there is no trace of Brian anywhere at all seems to not bode well. The body's never been found. There's never been any suspects. A psychic claimed that Schaeffer's body was in water near a bridge pier. However, you know, it's psychics. You can't really entirely trust that. And as of 2009, those responsible for the case did believe that he was still alive. His father died in the time that he's been missing, so if Brian Schaffer does ever turn up anywhere, um, he won't have anyone to go back to. 
but at this point it's 2021 almost 2022 yeah choke on that fact it's almost 2022 i doubt that brian schaefer will be coming around anytime soon tammy lynn leopard Tammy Lynn Leppard was an 18-year-old woman who was an actress, model, and beauty queen, and she went missing in July 6th of 1983. Now, she was described as paranoid when she got home before she went missing, and she also had deep knowledge of the local drug trafficking rings. This is Florida, by the way, so shit is going to be really fucking weird here. She then freaked out for a couple of days, believing that someone was after her and going to kill her, and then she went missing and was never seen again. There have been a lot of remains that have been dug up, as you can see on this chart here. However, none of these are her. They've all been ruled out as not. The investigation has mostly led to dead ends. There was a serial killer who was suspected, Christopher Wilder, who killed eight or nine young women before dying in a shootout with police, but there was no hard evidence that he committed the crime. John Crutchley was another serial kidnapper and rapist suspected of killing as many as 30 women. Uh, he committed suicide in prison. And despite age progressions and people looking for her everywhere, there's really been nothing, and considering it's been 38 years, one month, and nine days, I think Tammy Lynn Leppert is not going to be turning up anywhere, just like almost everyone else on this iceberg chart. Rest in peace. The Sodder Children Now, George Sodder was a man born in Italy, and he migrated to the United States 13 years after his birth with an older brother. He lived in a primarily Italian community and was well respected, except for the fact that in 1945, he really, really fucking hated Mussolini. And uh, this caused some tensions. On Christmas Eve of 1945, the family heard a thud on the roof, and then a fire broke out. The parents made it out, but the children were lost. However, the plot thickens because they were never able to find who burnt the house down, obviously. It was claimed to be an electrical fire, but there was evidence to suggest otherwise, and there were never any remains of the children. Human remains were found, which was a spine of what is estimated to be a 15 to 17 year old man. However, the youngest, the oldest child was too young to fit that profile, and that was their 14-year-old son. Now, it is possible that that is his spine, and he was just simply a big boy, but the fact that there were repeated excavations, the family continued to investigate it afterhand, and there were repeated attempts to drive the family away from their former property makes it really suspicious. However, the Sauter children were never found, and the mystery remains a mystery to this day. Lars Mittank. Lars Mittank was a German man taking a break in Bulgaria with some friends. He got involved in a bar fight and was unable to fly home with the rest of his group because of a ruptured eardrum and a fractured jaw. So he stayed alone in Bulgaria for a little bit. And then he started to act oddly. This was noted by the hotel CCTV cameras, and he also was called his mother and told her to cancel his credit cards because of the fact that he was going to be dead soon, and four men were coming to kill him. He was last seen on the day he planned to depart for Germany, talking to an airport doctor about whether or not he would be able to fly home when a construction worker interrupted the chat and he broke out into a sprint, hopped the fence, and was last seen next to the highway. He's never been seen since, and there's never been anything in terms of recovering his body. Oscar Zeta Acosta Oscar Acosta was a man who was a lawyer and dedicated himself to fighting for the people. He was friends with famous authors and also had a little bit of a penchant for drugs, primarily LSD and amphetamines. 
he went missing and his final phone call to his son in May 1974 says that he's about to board a boat full of white snow. I wonder what that could be. <laughs> After this, he was never found, but most people agree that he probably wound up mouthing off on the cocaine boat, getting into a fight, and then getting killed. Relisha Rudd. Relisha Rudd was a young woman who was staying with her mother, Shamika Young, at the DC General Shelter. As they were staying there, there was a janitor, Khalil Tatum, who had a record of getting a little bit too friendly with the people staying there, and he understandably went directly for Relisha Rudd. He bought her a tablet, went to take her to see a Disney on the ice, and then Rudd was reported missing. Now, Tatum killed his wife in the day after Relisha was reported missing and then killed himself, so we can't exactly suspect him. However, Relisha Rudd has never been found. Bobby Dunbar Bobby Dunbar was an American boy who went missing after a fishing trip with his parents. He was returned, quotation marks, and they lived the rest of their lives happily. The issue is, is that that kid also resembled a missing kid of another family. They went to court over it. The court decided that it was Bobby Dunbar and that the Dunbar family would be keeping little Bobby. And then DNA profiling proved a while later that that, in fact, was not Bobby Dunbar and that the real Bobby Dunbar forever remained missing. Jennifer Keese. Jennifer Keese was a woman from Orlando, Florida, which further proves that Florida is actually hell on earth, who, after having a relatively normal morning getting ready for work, speaking to her family, and then leaving, went missing. Her car was parked around a mile from her home by someone who obviously wasn't her, and investigators deduced that the car had been wiped down and that all of Jennifer's personal belongings had been removed from the car before they packed it away and left. And then she was never seen again. There's never been anyone arrested, no signs of a body, and wherever she may be, I hope she's all right. Louise Le Prince. Louise was the inventor of the first motion camera and also is widely considered the founding father of cinema. Crazy to think that you wouldn't be watching my dumbass blabber on here if he hadn't done what he did. Unfortunately, in September of 1890, Lee Prince was preparing for a trip to the United States, supposedly to publicly premiere his work and join his wife and children, but he wanted to visit his brother beforehand. So he hopped on a train after missing the first one, missing all of his friends and family there, visited his brother, spoke to his brother, and then was never found again. Now that's a little bit suspicious already, because how does such a famous man just go away? Now there were a few wildly unsubstantiated theories that were proposed, which was that there was a patent wars assassination, Christopher Rollins, an American guy, uh, pursues the assassination theory along with other theories, which is that the Le Prince family suspicion of Edison over patents is what got him killed. There's also disappearance ordered by his family, which supposits that Le Prince was killed by his family for financial reasons. Same deal with the fratricide theory. That's basically the same thing. They have it twice for whatever reason, though. However, there was a photograph unearthed almost a century after the entire ordeal of a drowned man in a river that wildly looks like Le Prince. Now, I find it pretty ironic that someone known for inventing cameras he had his body found after it was taken a picture of and stored with a camera for almost a century. Overall, thank you, Louis Le Prince, for all that you did, and I hope you rest easy. Kristen Smart Kristen Smart was a young woman born to military parents in Bavaria, West Germany, and she went to Polytechnic State University, or Cal Poly, in 1996 on the night she disappeared. She was partying with friends, typical college fashion, and then at 2 a.m. she was found passed out on a neighbor's lawn by two fellow students. 
and they decided to walk her back to her dormitory, and then another third student, oh noble he may be, Paul Flores, joined the group and offered to help the two return Smart to her dorm room. Along the way, the other two left, and it was just Paul Flores and Kristen Smart. Supposedly, Mr. Flores left her at his dorm and told her that she could walk the rest of the way, and that's what happened, except she was never found, and she didn't have any money or credit cards at the time she went missing, nothing of value, and nothing was taken from her dorm room. Now the investigation took quite a few years. Uh, the parents took a wrongful death case against Flores, but he was able to dodge it. And then in the aftermath, there was legislation passed because of the slow response. And then finally, in 2020, Paul Flores finally got his ass got by the police department in San Pedro. He has been arrested and charged with it. Now, because of the fact that statutory of limitations protects Paul Flores from the rape case, because she was raped when she died, uh, they can't get his ass on that. But first degree murder does not expire under the statute of limitations, and thus they can still catch his ass. I hope you get the entire broomstick shoved up your ass in prison, Paul Flores. Etan Pets. Etan Pets was an American boy from Manhattan who was abducted after school. He was never found, but there was a confession to his murder and kidnapping, which I find relatively horrible because it was over 30 years afterhand. Uh, Pedro Hernandez was the suspect, and he is an old man who has been sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Really meaningful when you're old as fuck. And, uh, that's about it. And now it's time for level three. We are three-fourths of the way through the first half of this iceberg chart, so praise be for that. You're almost done. If you made it this far, go ahead and like the video. And if you like the new backgrounds that I have for the iceberg videos, go ahead and thank my editor for that in the comments. Or go subscribe to her channel, which is linked in the description. Anyway, shameless self-advertisement time over. Buckle your fuckles. Let's just get into this. Brandon Lawson. Brandon Lawson was a Texas oil field worker who went missing. Who would have ever guessed? On August 8th of 2013, Brandon Lawson arrived at home, and then he went out at around 11.30 p.m., calling his brother and claiming that he had been ran out of town by Mexicans in the neighborhood. This bodes well. Supposedly, he had taken methamphetamines, but because of the fact that we can't find the body, this was never proven. And, you know, later that night, he called 911 saying his truck ran out of gas, that there's one car already there, and that people are chasing him to the woods. Several minutes later, trucker called 911 to report Lawson's truck, which was parked in a hazardous manner on the road. And then Lawson was never found. Now, despite a Facebook page about Lawson getting pretty popular and a very in-depth search by Texas authorities, Lawson was never found and remains missing to this day. Brianna Maitland Brianna Maitland was a 17-year-old young woman who went missing after her shift at the Black Bear Inn. Now, because of the fact that she wasn't living with her parents and her friends didn't know where she was, it was several days before she was filed as missing, and her car was eventually found in a barn, leading to suspicions of, you know, just a straight runaway or anything, except for the fact that Brianna left all of her important things inside her home, which meant that it had to be foul play. Of course, it gets a little bit more interesting because it always does. Things get a little bit worse from here because she isn't just never seen again. There isn't just no trace of her. There are several calls in which people claim that Brianna was kidnapped by drug dealers that she owed money and brutally murdered, as well as other calls made to the family rather than the police anonymously, stating that Brianna Maitland had been tied to a tree in the woods and left to die, and also hidden at the bottom of a lake. Really sickening, horrible shit. There's also 
the later developments of security footage at Caesars World Casino in Atlantic City, New Jersey, showing a woman resembling Maitland sitting at a poker table. However, it's a very large world out there, and there's seven billion of these stupid hairless fucking monkeys, so it's entirely possible that that wasn't Brianna. Gary Mathias Gary Mathias is part of a larger group of men who went missing known as the Yuba County Five or the boys from Yuba City. They were all a group of men with mild intellectual disabilities or psychiatric conditions, and they all went to attend a basketball game at California State University in Chico on the night of February 24th, 1978. Four of them were found dead. Gary Mathias has never been found. Now, what caused the disappearance, no one really knows. As a matter of fact, the car that they were all in was found 110 miles in the opposite direction of Chico's campus and their home in Yuba City. They had reached a mountain road where the snow line was at that time of year and just short of where the road was closed for winter. The car became stuck in some snowdrifts and they left it. And then, four out of the five froze to death. What gets even weirder, though, is the fact that they, st they stayed in a forestry department trailer with ample food, water, and stuff to keep you warm during the winter, and yet they were found half-starved and frozen to death. Again, Gary Dale Mathias has never been found, but considering the fact that four out of the five of them froze to, be froze to death, one of them in bed, one of them outside, it's really not hard to believe that one was just lost and never found. Whatever caused these strange circumstances, though, is an entirely different manner. Nexpo has a fantastic video on it that you should check out. The Springfield Three on June 7th, 1992, three friends and women from Springfield went missing. They left all of their personal belongings, including cars and purses, and there was no signs of a struggle except for a broken porch light outside. There was also a message on the answering machine the police believed might have provided a clue about the disappearances, but it was accidentally erased. Overall, in their disappearance, there was nothing that could lead to anything. There were over 5,000 tips about the case, though, especially after it was featured on America's Most Wanted. And then there was a man who called with such specific in information that they had to know something. Going to a parking garage with a ground-penetrating radar machine drew exactly where the man with the tip told them to go. They found three anomalies that were body-shaped underneath the parking garage. However, because of the fact that it's a parking garage and it's already been built, it would be a massive pain in the ass to dig it up and then rebuild the structure around it. So, they've never been found, but there is that major lead. Also, uh, 1997, Robert Craig Cox, a convicted kidnapper and robber, claimed that he knew the women had been murdered and that their bodies would never be recovered. So, at the time, he's been proven right, sort of. We don't know for sure that they've been murdered. However, someone calling a hotline with a tip and then finding three body-shaped holes at that tip doesn't, uh, doesn't exactly bode well for the Springfield Three. Frank Morris and the Anglin Brothers. Now, you probably don't recognize those names, but what you definitely will recognize is that these are the three maniacs who fucking escaped from Alcatraz, the supposedly most inescapable prison in America. Yes, these guys, fucking with spit cum and dreams, slapped together paper mache dolls, tunneled their way out, and then had a makeshift raft, which is utterly insane. Now, there were actually four people involved in the mistake, but one Mr. Alan West uh, simply didn't participate. He was left behind. The problem is, is that out of the four, the three that did leave were simply never seen again. There was a lot of wreckage that washed up on shores in the aftermath, including the men's personal belongings, but there has never been any 
bodies found or confirmed actually provable sightings of the three after the escape attempt. Some people say that because of the fact they were prisoners, they would have rather fucking drowned than leave behind their personal belongings. Other people have said that the Anglin brothers' family would receive calls, postcards, and anonymous flowers on Mother's Day, and that two tall, heavy women in extreme amounts of makeup were present at their mother's funeral. So that is what that is. Whether or not they did or didn't escape, they stuck it to the feds, which I can get behind, so fuck yeah. Except for the crimes they committed. That's not fucked yet. That's not fucked yet at all. Alfred Lowenstein. Alfred Lowenstein was a Belgian financer at his peak in the 1920s, which is to say that he, get, he got in on the fucking tendies during the dip and then profited. Mr. Diamond Hands here had around 728 million pounds in wealth according, you know, if you account for inflation from 1928 to 2019. And his wealth came from investments in electric power and artificial silk businesses when those industries were still in their infancy. Now, because of that, he understandably has a shit ton of money. Tendi's man here has his own plane back when that's new and cool. Imagine having a fucking Sky Tesla, you know, when that shit comes out. That's how rolling in gold this guy was. And then in 1928, he kind of fucking fell out of it. Yes, that's right. He fell out of his own airplane mid-flight and fell to his death. Now, this in and of its own is weird because he was only in the back of the aircraft to go to the bathroom and then somehow fell out of the plane because the entrance door was open. I mean, this would be an honest mistake if we were in, I don't know, a mobile home because it's very easy to open a door in a car while it's going. It's not very easy to open a door in a plane when it's flying because of the fact that you're going super fast, wind is super fast, and uh, that door is going to slam shut immediately. So understandably, there's been a lot of theories about what the fuck Tendi's boy here was doing in the back of his airplane. Some suspect a criminal conspiracy in which his employees murdered him, which would be good. Kill the fucking rich despots, please. New York Times hypothesized that it was a growing absent-mindedness <coughs> Alzheimer's that caused him to accidentally open the door, but again, you don't accidentally open a fucking plane door. Some people think that maybe his business wasn't doing so well, so Tendi's boy diamond-handed it all the way and killed himself rather than have another dip. And some even assert that corrupt business practices were about to be exposed, and therefore he committed suicide. None of these were ever proven, and Again, some people even think that Lowenstein somehow faked his death because it wasn't a conspiracy or anything. He just wanted to avoid getting caught up on fraud. And this is supported by the fact that his body after it was found was buried in an unmarked grave and his own wife didn't attend the funeral. Emanuela Orlandi Emanuela Orlandi was a 15-year-old girl who lived in the Vatican City studied church stuff, and played music while going to school in Rome. Now, she rode the bus there, and she'd always get off, walk around 180 to 210 meters, and then get to class. However, on Wednesday, June 22nd, 1983, she was late. She had asked for someone to ride with her on the bus to class, but people had declined because they had other obligations. And later that day, Emanuela called home speaking to one of her sisters about why she was late and that she had been offered a job with an Avon rep to sell makeup. She was last seen getting into a large dark colored BMW. And from there, there's nothing official. There are a few different reports that sound very convincing, which is a man calling himself Mario called her family and claimed to own a bar near Ponte Vittorio between the Vatican and Music School. The man said that a girl calling herself Barbara had confided to him about being a fugitive from home, but said she would return home for her sister's wedding. Another man going by Pierre Luigi. Pierre Luigi? Mario? Pierre Luigi reported that he and his fiance, fiance, I know how to speak, I swear to God, had met the missing girl in Piazza Navona that afternoon, 
Uh, she had her flute, her hair, her glasses, along with other details that perfectly fit her. And she stated that she had just run away from home and was selling Avon products. Uh, but she was never found. She never came back for her sister's wedding. And there's no good news out of this. There are a few different theories, which is that Agka, I, I'm butchering that pronunciation, I'm so sorry, a Turkish ultranationalist and neo-fascist youth organization member claimed that Bulgarian air agents of his organization had kidnapped her in exchange for a hostage deal where the Vatican gets the girl and they get Agta, who had shot the Pope in uh, 1981, I believe. Yeah, we're going to roll with that. There's also the organized crime theory, which is that the Mafia kidnapped her in order to, you know, get money back that they loaned to the church. Which, by the way, how the fuck are you going to call yourself a religious authority of the world and then take money from a local Mafia? And then there's also the Vatican sex scandal theory, which is that supposedly the Vatican police kidnapped her for sex parties and then murdered her. Uh... I wouldn't be too surprised by any of these. I mean, a hostage exchange makes sense if you kidnap a citizen of the Vatican. Organized crime theory doesn't make as much sense. Why would a church take money from, you know, that? But also the church has a habit of speaking out of its ass and not being what it says it is, so I wouldn't be too surprised. And if you've read about some of the shit that <laughs> members of the Vatican have been caught doing, cocaine-fueled gay sex orgies among them, uh, this one doesn't really faze me. That fits the Vatican a lot. There's also been a jaw found in a bag, but it was never confirmed to belong to Orlandi. And as of now, she's still missing and probably will be for all of time. John Favara. John Favara was a backyard neighbor of the Gambino crime family boss, John Gotti, in New York after he... And he disappeared after he struck and, oh shit, killed Gotti's 12-year-old son, Frank, by car as he darted into the street on a motorized minibike. So, let's line up the fact here. <laughs> the facts. Mr. Favara killed a mafia boss's son, disappeared, and was never seen again. Let's think really hard. I wonder, where is John Favara? What is he doing? What happened to him? Well, let's read into the disappearance. Let's see what we find there. Oh, there were several witnesses to the abduction, and accounts ranged from him being beaten with a baseball bat shot with a silenced 22 caliber pistol or both huh I wonder where is John Favara what happened to him where did he go Dorothy Arnold Dorothy Arnold was an American socialite <coughs> rich asshole who disappeared under mysterious circumstances in New York City in December of 1910. Now, because Dorothy came from a family of rich assholes, her dad simply didn't want to report her missing. It would be embarrassing. Oh no. So he instead took to a family friend and a lawyer, who understandably found no clue of her, and then hired the Pinkertons, who also didn't find anything. And from there, he finally went public with it, offering a today's money, $28,000, for any information that could lead to her retrieval, and was subsequently let down. Now, there are, of course, some important things that I've missed out here, which is that she left that day to buy a dress, was spotted by the cashier when she bought the dress, and a friend walking down 5th Street, and then said that she wanted to walk through Central Park before she went home. And that was the last time anyone really saw her. She was also trying to start her writing career, but every time she tried to put something in, it was rejected. So that was understandably a major cause of tension amongst her 
and her family. So what really happened to Dorothy? Well, either she, one, fucking killed herself, which, you know, as an author myself, the process of getting anything published makes me want to kill myself. So in 1910, when there isn't the internet, I can really understand that. Two, was kidnapped and murdered. There's some sick fucks out there, and just because it's 1910 doesn't mean that there aren't sick fucks out there. If anything, there's more, and they're not caught, so... You know, rich young woman walking through Central Park alone. A lot can happen. A lot can happen. And three, she eloped with a man. This one also makes sense, you know. Rich young woman. Ooh, she's got all the time in the world to fall in love. Who's to say she didn't find someone she really liked and simply disappear and go halfway across the nation or across the Atlantic or maybe even across the Pacific, who knows, to be with her newfound love? Uh, BuzzFeed Unsolved has even tried to take a crack at this case, but the fact that it's a century old means that it's really hard to figure out Jack, Diddle, or Squant. So, overall, this case is probably going to remain unsolved. And this has also probably got to be the first time that anyone's mentioned it since BuzzFeed Unsolved tried to crack it in 2019, because the OP of this iceberg had to go really fucking far to get this obscure of a case. Cynthia Gastel Cynthia Gastel was a formerly unidentified American murder victim who disappeared on April 3rd, 1980, and her body was found two years later, but remained unidentified for 30 years before matching DNA evidence put in. In 2001, DNA from Gastel's relatives were entered into the National DNA Database, and in 2012, it was revealed that a match had been made because of, get this, mitochondrial DNA. The Chad mitochondria is not only the powerhouse of the cell, I guess it's also the fucking powerhouse of cracking cold cases. The Beaumont Children In the 1960s, it was common practice to just simply go to the beach and let your kids go buck fucking wild. And in Australia, this was no different. So the Beaumont family went down to a beach and they let their children play and have fun. And then at the end of the day, the children never came home with the family because they never left the beach. The police believed that they had just been goofing around, so they were slow to search, only swept a small area, and then they swept a wider area when night came and none of the children were found at all. Understandably, given the social conditions of the time, no one was concerned at first, but things quickly turned worse because of the fact that the kids were just gone and there was no trace of them. Now, there have been several hoax letters. Uh, a psychic even came through and claimed to have located the bodies. Guy gives a bad name to all psychics and is why 90% of the people believe that that kind of stuff is bullshit. There was a lot of possible suspects, but no one was ever identified properly or charged. And with bodies never being found, there's no way to ever know. This case does have a huge impact, though, because it was the case that turned it from you need to, you know, you can just let your kids have fun in public spaces to you need to be watching your kids so they could disappear. And this case, even though most people have never heard of it, definitely had incredibly massive societal impact around the world. And that's level three finished. Now we're on to level four, the last level in this iceberg video before I call it a week and we wait until next week to dive into the lower half. Hopefully uh, there's no more kids on this iceberg and it's 18 plus only so I can be making jokes again, but I know your assholes are clenched in, in anticipation and excitement, so I'm just going to dive right on in. Michaela Bali. Michaela Bali was a 16-year-old young woman from Canada who lived in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, which is way to the fucking north. She disappeared and was last seen at a local bus stop in the early afternoon, but no further evidence of her movements can be found. Her fate is currently unknown. 
Now, April 12th, 2016 is when she went missing. She hasn't turned up since, so it's not too far gone for any hope to be left, but it is pretty much too far gone for any chance of us finding her. There are several theories about it, there are always several theories about it, and we additionally have online websites such as Web Sleuths and Reddit. If I hear we did it Reddit one more time, I'm gonna kill myself. But they dedicated to her disappearance and searched for it. However, there's been no sign of it. All that we really have to work with is the runaway theory, which is that police have consistently treated Bailey's disappearance as a missing person's case that have no evidence of foul play, suggesting that they still consider her running away a possibility. Far to the north, isolated in a small town, even if you have a good relationship with your parents, sometimes it becomes too much. Maybe she just wanted something new and left. Or the human trafficking theory, which states that she was kidnapped for the sex of, uh, sexual exploitation, a much more grim theory, but also possible. And lastly, the online predator theory. Bailey had an extensive online presence and a number of social media apps that she talked to people on. It's entirely possible that she talked to someone who said, hey, come to where I live, and things only got worse from there. However, this isn't too likely because all of the passwords to all of her accounts were surrendered by the parents, and the only one that had anything of mild concern was Kick. And if you don't know what Kick is, Kick is a texting platform for 90% of the time horny degenerates. So I think we could all see why there's something a little problematic there. But overall, she's still gone. There's probably not going to be any evidence that comes up anytime soon. I hope you're okay, Michaela. Crystal Rogers. Crystal Rogers was a woman from Bardstown, Kentucky, who went missing on July 3rd, 2015. She was 35 year old, years old and a mother of five, and the last person to have ever seen her was her boyfriend, Brooks Houck. Uh, they went to bed, and then when Brooks woke up, Crystal was nowhere to be found and the car was gone. Two days later, on July 5th, Crystal's Chevrolet was found parked with a flat tire by a mile marker off the Bluegrass Parkway, and the keys were still in the ignition. Her purse and cell phone were also still there. She was officially reported missing by her mother the same day, and after that, nothing. Silence. The Ballard family was very vocal about their suspicion of Brooks Houck, uh, if your son is named Brooks, he deserves to be suspected by people for things. And it doesn't help that Brooks' brother, Nick, was a police officer who, when Brooks was being questioned, told him to stop talking to the police and refused to cooperate with his co-workers. That definitely doesn't smell super fishy at all. Now, of course, there's never been any sign of it, and the only thing that has happened since then is Crystal Rogers' father, Tommy, went hunting and was shot. Besides that, nothing of note has happened in the case since. Weldon Keyes Weldon Keyes was an influential mid-20th century poet and general artist who went missing. Now, he went missing after several failed and bad productions that took a major toll on his mental health. Because of the fact that he went missing in such a manner, in July of 1955, he called a friend who was also a biographer, arranged a meetup, never made that meetup, and then his car was found on the side of the Golden Gate Bridge. So while he is missing, I don't think it's too hard to piece together what happened. Akia Eggleston Akia Eggleston was a 22-year-old woman from Baltimore, Maryland, and she was reported missing on May 7, 2016, after failing to show up to her own baby shower. She was eight months pregnant at time of the disappearance, and there has been no trace and no suspects. The search continues. Now you're probably, probably noticing that this is the first one that hasn't had Wikipedia as a background, so I'll go ahead and explain that a little bit. I have never used 
Everipedia before. I don't know how trustworthy this website is. I only collaborated it with several other articles that I read to prove that it was trustworthy before using this as a background. I keep using Wikipedia because Wikipedia is consistently reliable as fuck. Gene Spangler. Jean Spangler was an American actress and model who lived in Los Angeles, California, and disappeared October 7, 1949, after telling her daughter she was meeting with her daughter's father to discuss a late child support payment and do filming for a film she was starring in. She never returned home the next morning, and a missing persons case was filed. For a while, there was not much until October 9th, 1949, when Spangler's purse was found, and there was a note inside talking about having to see a Kirk and a Dr. Scott. Now, the note ended in a comma implying that there was more, but there wasn't much there. There were theories about an actor she had worked with, Kirk Douglas, because she had a role in Young Man with a Horn, but... Kirk quickly denied that because he only talked to her about once. She was never found, her daughter went to her father, and then from there, life just continued. Virginia Dare Virginia Dare was the first child born in the Roanoke colony and also the first child of European descent born in the New World. Now, in case you live under a rock or dislike history, which, fun fact, people who dislike history are subhuman, Roanoke Colony vanished. It collapsed. Winter came, there wasn't enough food, and when people came to check in, there's just simply nothing. No people. Virginia Dare included. And that's a centuries-old mystery that there is no chance in hell I'm going to solve or dive into. Not even BuzzFeed could solve it. Not even Mudahar could solve it. it. They're just gone. There is one theory, though, which is that the Roanoke colonists camped up with the natives after, you know, they ran out of food, and this one makes sense because humans tend to stick together. Rico Harris. Rico Harris is a former NBA player who, in October 10th of 2014, went missing after visiting his mother and finally getting his life back to a semblance of normal since leaving the NBA. Now he went down to visit his mom and talk about unresolved issues from his childhood, felt like he didn't get what he wanted out of the conversation, and then turned around to head back to Washington State where he lived with his girlfriend. Somewhere along the way, he stopped driving took a few videos on his phone, and then left the car. He hasn't been seen since, and there is no sign of him anywhere. However, Rico Harris's story has a much happier ending than a lot of these, because there's ample evidence to suggest that there is no foul play here. Rico Harris left his car behind, but he also posted videos showing him having a good time, accidentally, the night that he stopped talking to everybody. There's also been shoe prints found in nearby towns from where he stopped his car, matching his size, and saying it's how Mr. Harris is a size 18, there's not exactly a lot of people who can match that. The detective in charge of the case simply left it as is, because it's likely that Rico just wanted to disappear. Whatever it was he couldn't resolve, he felt was picking out his life enough, that he just simply had to change what his life was. Whatever happened to Rico Harris, I hope he's okay, but I think he's having a good time. Kaylin Lauder On September 27th, 2014, Kaylin Lauder was let go from her job at a local school. She lived in Murray, Utah, and she made a 911 call directly after being let go from her job while at home, claiming that there were two intruders in her home. The problem is, is that the door was still deadbolted, and even her roommate came out to ask what was going on, and how could anyone still be in the home. After this, she goes for a walk with her dog with no shoes, no phone, or wallet in pouring rain. From there, she's never seen again. Her behavior is described as erratic, 
and that's all there is to go off of. In December of 2014, her body was found in the nearby Jordan River, and her autopsy was completed April of 2015, and it was inconclusive. So what happened to Kaylin Louder? I don't really know, but what it sounds like is a spiraling mental health state combined with the tension that bottling up symptoms have, on top of being fired from your job, can easily make someone want to go out and get lost. And it's easy to get lost and then succumb to exposure. I doubt she was murdered, and I doubt it was intentional suicide, but one way or another she wound up accidentally killing herself. I hope you rest in peace, Kaylin. Abby Patterson. Now, this case was a pain in the ass to research, so much so that I'm on News 13, the local Lumberton News website. And, uh, yeah, that tells you how far I had to go. Um, Abby Lynn Patterson was a 20-year-old woman who had just returned from rehab in Florida days before she vanished. She disappeared on Wednesday, September 5th, 2017, and the cause of her disappearance is still unknown. She simply turned off her phone, no one could contact her, and she got in a car with an acquaintance and was never seen again. Now, whether or not this said acquaintance killed her, it's not likely. Uh, the driver was questioned by police, but he, Patterson was dropped off at another location, so he got off scot-free. The issue is that months prior to Patterson's disappearance, the bodies of three women were found in Lumberton, so that doesn't bode well for her. Again, though, foul play is still not suspected. However, it's not very likely Abby Lynn Patterson is going to be turning up anytime soon. Kiplin Davis. Kiplin Davis was a 15-year-old girl who disappeared from her high school campus in Spanish Fork, Utah. She had an argument with her parents the day that she disappeared just before she went to school, attended her early classes, all of her morning classes, and was seen at lunchtime in the school's cafeteria with her friends. But she didn't show up to her 4th and 5th period classes. One person did say that they spoke to her between 4th and 5th period, but later changed his story. And all of her personal belongings, her purse, makeup, dental retainer, school books, and whatnot were left in her locker, and she never returned home from the day. She was reported missing when she failed to arrive home at 5 o'clock, when she was always home by 3.30. After months passed without any clues or Davis's return, police began to suspect foul play in her disappearance, and although she had a fight with her parents the day of, and even mentioned running away, her family believes that she was murdered. In 2003, the year I was born funny, U.S. Attorney Paul Warner revived the probe into Davis's death, and Timmy Brent Olson and Christopher Neal Jepsen were charged with her murder. Jepsen was let go because they couldn't prove that he had done anything, but Timmy Brett Olson pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He said that he saw another individual hit Davis in the head with a rock and helped him move her body but declined to name the other individual. Although he admitted he helped move and bury the body, he also refused to tell authorities where the body is located. He came under suspicion after saying that he left school with Davis on the day that she disappeared, but it took an obscenely long time to get his ass. I hope you rest in peace, Kiplin Davis. Susan Powell. Susan Powell was a native of West Valley City, Utah, and on the morning of December 6th, 2009, her and her sons, as well as her husband, all attended church services, leaving at about 5 p.m. And that was the last time Susan was seen by someone outside the Powell household. The entire family was reported missing on December 7th by relatives, Joshua, Susan's husband, his mother, sister, and others went looking for their family, and then called the police when no one was there. The police bursted in, fearing that the family were victims of carbon monoxide poisoning, but they found no one inside. Later, Joshua and the kids returned home in the family's only vehicle, a Chrysler Town & Country minivan that Joshua had been using. Now, because he returned home with the two boys, he was taken to a police station for questioning, 
and he claimed that he had left Susan sleeping at home shortly after midnight on December 7th and taken his boys on a camping trip to Simpson Springs in western Utah. Police visited Simpson Springs, found no evidence of the campsite, but when questioning the elder son, he did collaborate that there was a camp there. However, he said that Susan had come with. Susan was never found, but some horrifying and terrifying developments later happened, which is Joshua, while being investigated for the murder of Susan Powell, killed his two sons in a double homicide, and then killed himself. It's truly disgusting, and I hope that some unspeakable things happen to that man in hell if it is real. And, uh, yeah, this one was really, really fucked up to read. However, Joshua absolutely deserved to die a horrible death. So, uh, yeah, Susan Powell was most likely murdered by her husband, who then killed her two sons when the fuzz got onto him that, you know, he murdered his wife. Utah! Let me tell you, Utah, terrible fucking place. Genuinely. I've lived in Utah before, and it's the worst. Imagine every southern state took all of the worst parts of it and combined it. That's Utah. The only bearable parts of that town have to be Panguitch in the south, and that's if you don't talk to anyone but the high school students who are all flaming gays, or Salt Lake City. That's it. Those are the only two places in Utah that are valid. The rest of it needs to be wiped from existence. In a less fucking terrible entry, we have the Flannan Isles Lighthouse Keepers. Now, this is the final entry on this half of the iceberg, so I'm very excited. If you made it this far, go ahead and just subscribe. I've entertained you this long. Just press the goddamn button. But, getting into it, three men were in charge of keeping the Flannan Isles lighthouse lit, and it was noticed on 15th of December 1900 when a steamer Archer was on passage from Philadelphia to Leith, noted in its log that the light was not operational in poor weather conditions. When the ship docked in December 18th, they went ahead and informed the Northern Lighthouse Board. The Northern Lighthouse Board wasn't able to send anyone up there until noon of 26th December 1900. The lighthouse was manned by James Ducat, Thomas Marshall, and Donald MacArthur, with a rotating fourth man spending time on shore. But arriving on the island, they found that the flagstaff had no flag. The usual provision boxes had been left on the landing stage for restocking. And more ominously, none of the lighthouse keepers were there to welcome them. A captain of the Hesperus, the boat responsible for going ahead and looking for them, attempted to reach them by blowing the ship's whistle and then firing a flare, but was unsuccessful. At last, a boat was launched and Joseph Moore, the relief keeper, was put on shore alone. He found that the entrance gate to the compound and the main door were both closed, the beds were unmade, and the clocks had stopped. Returning to the landing stage with the grim news, he then went back up to the lighthouse with the Hersperus second mate to seamen, and a further search revealed that the lamps had all been cleaned and refilled. A set of oil skins was found, suggesting that none of the keepers had left the lighthouse without them, and there was no sign of the keepers anywhere, neither on the lighthouse or anywhere on the island. So, uh, what the hell happened to them? Well, there is a lot of speculation and theory, um, mostly because it was pretty phenomenal in 1900 for a lighthouse to go out and could fuck over a lot of people, so something phenomenal had to have happened, right? Some people said that it was a giant sea serpent or sea bird that just simply fucking ate them. Uh, some people in modern times have suggested aliens or time warps or whatever. Some people have even suggested malevolent ghost boats filled with ghost pirates killing them. But what's more likely is that they were simply trying to recover something from the beach in poor weather, which there was a lot of this year, a lot of bad weather in 1900, and then were washed away to sea where they were never found again. Holy fucking shit, lads, lasses, la-enbies, we have done it. This is my biggest video yet, and it's not, this is half, this is half, and it's already over an hour, but it's finally done. We did it. 
I'd like to thank you all so much for watching this. So much work went into it. Uh, if you appreciated this, go ahead and leave a like, comment something you liked, or just subscribe. All of these things are free. You can undo them at any time, and it helps me reach my dreams. And if you liked the work that was put into this video, also make sure to go ahead and subscribe to my editor's channel, B, which will be in the description, because none of this would be possible without her. <sighs> Fuck. The next half is gonna come next week, because I crank these out at supersonic speeds, call me a rap god of iceberg charts. But until next time, have a wonderful time. Memento Mori.